Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I'm Karen Schofield Lakeham. My pronouns are per and hers, short for person, and I am the efficient today. Wes is one community united across time and space, and we gather for these Sunday platforms to affirm our values and commit to a better world. So I want to welcome you who are here in the hall and who are watching now on Zoom and those who are catching it as a recording later. If you are on Zoom, please check the chat for a welcome and various tips from Paul Baker, who is today's Zoom chat usher. If you're here in the hall and would like an assistive listening device, you can please check in with the sound team at the back. Special welcome to our visitors today. No. <laughs> welcome everyone for visiting today. Um, we, of course, as we know, so we'll just remind those of us who are here that we can be the welcome wagon to those who do visit. And um, we always, of course, love to welcome visitors and um, hear like what questions you have, tell us what we love about it, see what it is you're seeking. Um, you can look for people who have a pre-printed name badge to answer those questions or point you in the right direction. I'm gonna now check in with Zoom to see what people have had to say in the chat. And let's see, so Judy and Randy say good morning. Oh wait, I have to scroll way back. Um, Ann T says, good morning, first time attendee here. Welcome, Ann, yay. <laughs> and there's lots of warm welcomes in the chat to that. Um, we have good mornings from Joe Klein. Um, Eric Moyer says, oh, alas, he is dialing in from Gaithersburg because he was exposed to COVID a few days ago, but very grateful to be able to participate via Zoom. Cynthia Goodman says, good morning. So does Nadine. And Peter Truce joining from Petworth for another first time attendee. So welcome, Peter. Glad you're here. Nadine is also at her first time attending. And excuse me if I'm mispronouncing anybody, I apologize for that. Um, this is what happens when we make assumptions. Um, and Bart Nathanson is also here this morning and saying good morning. So yay, we're, we're delighted to have so many new folks joining us this morning. And it is indeed good to connect and share this time together across time and space. Our opening words this morning are the poem, Invitation to Arrive and Rest by Sherry Woodbury, slightly adapted. Out of the din of the city, away from the noise of the crowds, we come to rest in this moment, in this place set apart from the never ending to-do lists. Embracing this day of rest, we come to the warmth and stillness of this sacred hour. Remember, you have chosen to be here. Something in your life led you to arrive here, now. Whatever tasks and cares await you, now, for this brief time, simply rest. Allow your soul to be nurtured. Let the waves in your mind and heart gradually subside as you come home to yourself, holy and whole. Come, let us reflect together. Today's opening song is Loose, Loosen, performed by Ali Halpert.
Each week, we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash read SOP. You can read it here in person or make a recording that will be included in a later platform. Today's reader is Emily Newman. Emily leads the West Auction team as a new addition to the Sunday Efficiency team. So you'll soon begin seeing even more of Emily up here on stage. Emily, you wanna do the statement of purpose first? Thanks. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thanks, Emily. As Emily lights our community a candle, I invite everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Our story for all ages this morning was selected by our speaker, Robin Kravitz. Enjoy. Patience is my superpower, written by Alicia Ortego. Hello, my name is Dan, and I have just turned eight. I love doing a lot of things, but I really hate to wait. One morning, while I was cozy in my warm and snuggly bed, next Friday, we're off to the village, my lovely mother said. Hooray! I was so happy that I gave out a little squeak. But then suddenly I realized I had to wait a week? The week went by so slowly. I was grumpy as could be. It's only five school days, my mom explained to me. The days at school were so boring. I cannot tell a lie. The only thing on my mind was Granny's famous pie. Finally, Friday came, my grump replaced with smiles. But then I calculated that we had to drive for miles. I really wished at that point I had a teleport machine because I was bored in the car as I had ever been. Mom said, I know, let's play the guess who game. Reluctantly, I agreed and guessed the first mysterious name. Next, we played the license plate game in which I proved pretty smart. And then I told my mom a joke about a stinky fart. We're here, Mom said. And as I rubbed my eyes, I saw my grandparents' house. What a wonderful surprise. When thinking back, I was amazed how much fun we'd had in the car. So much fun that driving to the house didn't seem that far. When Granny saw me, she scooped me up and hugged me really tight. I couldn't move my arms, even if I wanted to fight. I longed for Granny's famous pie, rattling my fork and plate. But the pie was in the oven, so again, I had to wait. Granny took me to her garden, filled with beautiful flowers, wanting to show me the meaning of patience and its superpowers. Granny picked an unripe fruit and told me to try a bit. Yuck! It's disgusting, I said, and out I had to spit. Unripe fruit is bitter for those who cannot wait until it ripens and becomes the yummiest fruit you ate. Then she shows me a hive placed among the trees 
and said, we get honey thanks to hard-working bees. That honey takes a while to make, and aren't you glad, she said, because you get to smother it on fresh and crusty bread. Passing by the chicken coop, Granny showed several eggs lying quietly in the straw tucked between hen's legs. I want to see the baby chicks, I began to yell, but you'll only find the yolk if we open up the shell. If you are patient enough and wait a little while, the new life that will be born will be sure to make you smile. Ready to fill your tummy? Granny turned and asked. The pie must be ready. Wow, time passed so fast. When eating my slice of delicious pie and sipping my cup of tea, I understood how much fun the waiting parts can be. Later, Grandpa and I played chess in the afternoon, but then came time when Mom said we should be leaving soon. We'll finish our game next week, my Grandpa kindly said. I was very sad, but I decided to be patient instead. Granny gave me a piece of pie and a hive poster, too. Color every day when you learn something new. When you see that school days can be fun and really great, you'll be amazed how many things you can learn while you wait. And she was right. Patience is a very pleasant thing, especially when waiting something nice it can bring. I was patient as I waited my turn on the slide and as I waited my turn on the merry-go-round ride. Every day I painted a poster during the school break while thinking of chess with Grandpa and the next move I would make. When I learned to plant a tree or a beautiful flower and when I learned that patience is my superpower. Let us enter now into the centering time of our platform. Each week we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today I'm particularly mindful of the many places around the world where accountability for leaders who have misbehaved are taking place. And may, may we indeed see justice served. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. and let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. I invite you now into a time of meditation. Encourage you to relax, shift around as you need to, to find a position of greatest ease for your body. Let your thoughts slow down and breathe. And today we will have a musical meditation.
Welcome back. Our reading today is entitled Keep on Practicing uh, by Anonymous. It is written by a person in addiction recovery and in keeping with custom, they eschew individual attributions in order to place principle before personalities. Kenneth Jones and Tima Okun include in their list of characteristics of white supremacy culture, a constant sense of urgency and the idea that progress means things getting bigger and more numerous. These do not just undermine racial justice, they are also counterproductive to serenity. While it may be urgent to work toward creating justice and healing climate change, I can't do that work unless I have a sense of calm. Ways to counter these harmful characteristics, including making realistic work plans that include quality goals. I may see green leaves coming from the ground, but if I go ahead and yank on them right away, I'll get a handful of greens with no carrot attached. This might be obvious to someone who doesn't struggle with an addictive disposition, but I've got to keep reminding myself to settle down, to wait, to keep on practicing. The beauty of continuing to practice, to wait, to do just one thing at a time, is that through patience, I am gifted not only with carrots, but also another day of sobriety. Our platform speaker today is Robin Kravitz. Robin has been a member of West for about eight and a half years and on staff for eight years. In that time, she has run not just one thing at a time. It has included the coming of age program, teen program, communications, rentals, the West podcast and website, and almost everything in between. Currently, Robin is running the communications and HR side of the West office. Her favorite animal is a Triceratops, and her favorite place on the planet is Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park. She also has a deep love of event t-shirts, and she's learning to nap guilt-free. <laughs> Robin, all yours. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, when I first decided um, to give a platform, it was in a staff meeting, and I didn't really know what I wanted to say. But I have this deck of oracle cards written by Trisha Hearsey, and uh, I just wanna share with you the card I drew so you can kind of know where I'm coming from. The front says, I don't belong on the grind. I'll get off. So the description says, rest in the truth of the power you hold over grind culture. A full mental shift starts in your quiet moments. You'll get your healing back through rest. You will be disruptive and you're gonna push back. You'll slow down and you'll take a nap. So with that, good morning everyone. How are y'all doing? Um, I just have to say, I absolutely love that story about patience. Um, and it really is a great reminder, I think, for anybody who has to drive like the DC Beltway at any point, you know, just some patience. But I do want to start off today with a bit of a trigger warning and uh, a little more context. I'm pretty angry. Um, I don't say that lighthearted, like viscerally angry. Um, I had a really hard time writing this platform. I went through at least eight drafts. <laughs> so I hope you'll listen open-heartedly um, and provide me grace in that uh, I'm not a minister or a senior leader, and that is a distinct skill set. <laughs> I wanna share some messages with you all from the Nextdoor app. Does everybody kinda know what the Nextdoor app is? Okay. <laughs> The Nextdoor app is a, it's a social media platform based upon where you live. 
So it's not like who your friends are, it's like everybody that lives in your like zip code or your area, you can kind of all get together. So like if you lose a dog, hey, lost my dog, right? Like it's kind of that. But I found four messages I wanna read with y'all. Number one, I know you're not paid much and certainly not enough for your level of knowledge and responsibility. However, this task is simply a matter of cut and paste. It's just an email, then you click send. If I did the task, it would take me two minutes at most, but I don't have your secret list. Just send out the announcement. Number two, I just discovered something very disturbing. Do you know my Gmail doesn't show me the whole message you sent? Evidently, it's been the case whenever you send me large emails. There's like this little line at the bottom and it says message clicked. Message clipped, view entire message here. <laughs> Correct, Calliope. <laughs> Turns out this is beyond the display of my email cutoff, and there's information down there I've never seen. <laughs> Number three, we have a general problem of communication in our neighborhood. I see that there's a meeting from our HOA that's been scheduled at the same time as my other meeting. Um, I wish the neighborhood meeting had been scheduled around my schedule, um, but now that it is scheduled, I'm gonna have to cancel my standing meeting. Number four, this is the last one I promise. <laughs> the date and time for the potluck conflicts with our neighborhood memorial service that's planned for the same day and time. This is really unacceptable and inexcusable. There are two choices as I see it. You must either change the date or the venue. I hope this conflict is resolved by the end of the week I'll be sending out a separate email and text later to make sure it's been handled appropriately. Now, y'all indulge me. What do you think are some of the emotions that the authors of these messages were feeling? Just shout them out. Control. Control. Frustration. Say it again. Frustration. Frustration, yeah. Now, let's flip the pancake over. What do you think the person who received these messages felt? Rage? Shame? Fear? Sounds like a pretty toxic neighborhood, <laughs> right? Um, but now I need to have a confession with you guys. Those are emails that were sent to the West staff from West members. Um, so I want to be like re real transparent. I wanna give you the emotions <laughs> that we as a staff, and, and really I'm gonna speak for myself. I, I don't know what emotions my colleagues had, but I felt defensiveness, frustration, exhaustion, <laughs> unworthy, and toxicity. Um, you know, I'm a pretty strong person and I can hold my own. Um, but strong people get to like be upset too. So I felt this deep pressure in these moments when I received these kinds of emails to be so time conscious. You know, I'm doing as much as I can, the whole staff is within the hours we're given. And it's based upon a budget you all passed. I get not everybody has a ton of money to make our budget problems go away but we do have the capacity to be kind. That was a lot. <laughs> That's my introduction. <laughs> um, so I just kinda felt like ripping the Band-Aid off was the best way to do it today. So if y'all wanna just join me in like a collective like deep breath. <laughs> so, with all this out on the table, I want to really kind of dive into like where this toxicity is coming from. On an individual level, one on one, I adore everybody in this con congregation. So what's happening, <laughs> right? Like what is going on? I'm going to give you a little spoiler. Uh, number one, white supremacy culture. Number two, take a nap. So. Let's dive in, shall we? So y'all, I've spent almost two years studying under Beth Berry, 
She's an author, a coach, um, and a program called Motherworthy. It's these awesome, like really awesome circles. She facilitates, we basically meet every Friday, an hour and a half on Zoom with mothers all over the country. Um, it's a really tight knit group and if I'm honest, it has been completely life changing. Um, and even further for transparency, my professional expense that you all provide me in our budget is what has paid for this class for me. Um, because it has been so regenerating and so educational for me. Um, so I do want to express appreciation for professional expenses. They, they really do get used and I hope you can see it from every staff member that we are doing our best with the budget we're given. So let's talk about what I've learned in these groups. I've talked about motherhood. Is it like our identity? Do we get to be anything more? Like once you're a mom, is that like it? Um, and is anyone's house like actually clean? Anybody, anybody's house actually clean? Um, talk about the over culture. You know, maybe if I, if I buy this one trendy thing, it was on TikTok, it was on Instagram, I'm gonna buy this one thing, my life's gonna be better. This item's gonna fix it all. And then as soon as it fixes it, it's gonna calm down and I'm gonna totally catch up. Like next week, I'll be caught up. And we talk about exhaustion. You know, is adulting like hard for everybody or like am I just doing it wrong? <laughs> uh, we talk a lot about history and racism. Learned a lot about the history of people, like being people. Exactly. Um, it's, it's so different than what we're you know, taught in school. You know, I took AP US history. I took you know, history all through college and I'm sitting here as an adult like, y'all didn't teach me anything. <laughs> um, so just to kind of veer, I wanna share a little story I learned. It's probably one of my favorite historical stories. So if y'all just kind of indulge me, I'm gonna go off the rails a little bit. For centuries, even millennia, women lived alone and worshiped the earth, the air, the fire, and the water. Many women also had cats. You know, there were companionship. If you're living here alone, a cat's a, a great companion. Then the powers that be read that white men in positions of power became worried that all these women would like join together and then you know, take over and they'd be out of power. So, you know, if these women got together, they were a potential threat. So the white men in power began marketing campaigns to these single women by calling them witches and saying they were a danger to the children. You know, you may have heard what happened next. Witch trials in Europe kicked off and we saw between 1400 and 1700-ish about 60,000 women killed for suspected witchcraft. Pretty awful. <laughs> but here's where it gets interesting, and this is where our textbooks, like, we're like, we're done. Um, you know, all these women had cats. Cats then either fled to the countryside where they were able to find food, to live naturally, or they died. And here's where it gets even better. You ready? Cats in the city hunted rats. When the cats left because the women were killed, the rats took over Europe and brought the plague. Long story short, y'all need to stop messing with women. We're not joking around. So, you know, karma. But why is that not in our, like why is it not in our history books? It's so, not only fascinating, but just so important. It's been really eye-opening what I've been taught through this class, um, what's been marketed to me, what's actually happening in our societies. Some of the other awesome lessons about the overculture, society, patriarchy, whatever you wanna label it, really boils down to control and maintaining the status quo. I learned I've been asking the wrong question. I used to ask like, what is wrong with me that I don't enjoy this life more? Well, Beth Berry and Mother Worthy taught me it's okay to have joy. And it's okay to not apologize for your joy. Y'all may have noticed that I've come into my own with my love of Disney. 
that's me and my joy and I'm not gonna apologize for it and I'm not gonna explain it. I've also learned about sisterhood. I know um, some of the women in my circle are watching today and I'm just gonna leave it there at the sake of ugly crying. <laughs> we discussed the patriarchy and how it hurts everyone. I recommend you watch Mike's platform from back in July. Maybe a little biased, but I thought it was really good. <laughs> you know, Beth also gave us a chance to dive into our core values and what we need, not to survive, but to thrive. I've defined for myself over all of this work that I need stability, I need to be seen, and I need to feel capable. Beth taught us that when we're better at having our needs met, it allows for bandwidth for our values to shine through. For me, my core values are loyalty, community, and inner peace. If you asked me a few years ago, there's no way I could have defined that. No way. So I'm gonna ask our Zoom usher right now, there's a link in the script if they could drop it in for the folks at home. Um, and the folks here, I hope on the way in, you grabbed um, one of the worksheets. On one side, you've got values. On the other side, you have needs. Um, I just kind of want everybody to take a second, kind of look over that. Um, find a value that really speaks to you, that if your life were great and stress-free, this is what you would be shining through. And then find a need that needs to get fulfilled to reach that value. And if you just wanna take a second or take a couple of minutes, share with your neighbor and just listen to the needs and values of those around you. I'm gonna get everybody about like 90 more seconds. You don't have to solve all the world's problems now. <laughs> If you all wanna start wrapping up, um, I really encourage these conversations to continue um, afterwards online. All that stuff. I will say one of the endearing things about Wes is anytime we do anything that is uh, like chatty, it's like you, know, you should just double the amount of time you give folks. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I encourage you, take this, think about it. This list is not perfect. It's not supposed to be. Add to it if what's there isn't right for you. Delete something, change language, make it what it needs to be for you. You know, I hope as you were talking to your neighbors that you noticed people have different needs and different values. We aren't monochromatic in any way. And that's what makes a community stronger is the fact that everybody brings different values, different needs, different tools and skills. And we put it all together in a big puzzle and we make a congregation. But before we get too far away from this, I have to talk about racism. 
When it comes to needs and values, you can't ignore racism. Beth told me, and I'm going to quote her, and it's kind of long, but like, why mess up what somebody's already done, right? She says, as a whole, black mothers and other mothers of color are perhaps more than anyone accustomed to the physical and emotional survival mode that accompanies a life full of unmet needs. When someone expends energy every day, day after day, trying to stay safe, trying to keep her children safe, trying to feel seen and heard and valued, to be recognized and respected, and to fight for access to healthy food, health care, safe, affordable housing, for example, there is little energy, there's little time left for them to rest, restore, create, or better their lives. It just feels like a lot. I know how hard my life has been as a woman, but I've at least been white. And how hard it must be for women of color. It makes me pretty speechless. The gap between those that have privilege and those that have less is perpetuated, y'all, by the extra burden that women of color and mothers carry in the form of relentless emotional labor and heavier mental loads. West folks, I'm calling in right now those that are committed to deconstructing our internalized racism, deconstructing our implicit bias, and especially those in this room, those on Zoom, those listening to the recording, that identify themselves as white, cisgendered, hetero men with financial stability. I think back to those emails that the West staff received. There is not a single member of our staff that doesn't hold some marginalized identity. I often feel really responsible and protective of the staff. I feel the most privileged, I live a pretty heteronormative lifestyle, I'm white, I'm not worried about paying my mortgage next month. I don't have to talk to my child about how to interact with the police safely. Our entire staff doesn't get to have that experience. And I have to tell you, we used to have a white man on staff. Adore him, so sad he retired. Y'all don't talk to him like you talk to the rest of us. I've been in that office. I've been CC'd on emails. Y'all do not talk to the current staff with the same respect and dignity you did to the white man on staff. Anti-racism work is part of a life long practice, humbling, self-examination, unlearning, trying to do better, falling short, relearning, working toward reparations, expressions and practices. It's not virtuous to defend and pretend we have no growth. Even with the best of intentions, we're all going to fall short. It comes to living our true values. Pretending we've already arrived because we're good people, because we held some posters on 16th Street with the names of people that have been killed by police. It's not done. This experience isn't a checkbox. Just because you participated in an Aramac survey doesn't mean you're excused from doing the work. So, how on earth do we do this? I feel like I've thrown a lot at you guys. <laughs> Hope everybody had their coffee today. Um, but I do have some solutions I'd love to suggest to everybody. Trisha Hearsey um, is a, a fabulous author, theologian, 
and elect. She wrote a manifesto called Rest is Resistance. If you haven't read it, order it today, <laughs> read it. Her ministry is called the Nat Ministry. And she teaches us that grind culture wants us to be cogs in a wheel. Trissa Hearsey weaves a story of capitalism, slavery, patriarchy, and urgency. From the start, she goes to where Europeans began invading North America, all the way through slavery, and generations and generations of really specifically black women who've had to just try and stay safe. So I sat back and I was like, okay, I've done this mother worthy work, read this book, what do we do with it? And I, I've got a theory, sorry in advance, uh, white supremacy culture is alive here at West and it's thriving in the DC area, absolutely thriving. Now I can hear some people, wait, Robin, we're doing the work. We have our ends, we have our focus goals. What are you talking about? This doesn't connect. Okay, let me break it down. White supremacy is about power and control. In Hearsay's manifesto, she shares that, quote, grind culture is a collaboration between white supremacy and capitalism. You know, if, if we stay in the status quo, if I don't get up and have the really uncomfortable platform, if I don't share these emails we're receiving, we don't have a chance to grow and the power may never shift. This grind culture we're in keeps us all so busy. It wants us to push toward urgency and perfection and just keeps pushing. See, when we're all busy, when we're all overwhelmed, trying to get everything done as fast as possible and as perfect as possible, we lose the time to be creative, we lose the time to find a new way of living, and we dig ourselves deeper into capitalism, deeper into white supremacy. Resting is not a waste of time. Rest is a generative space. When you're resting, your body, your brain, your organs, they're processing information. They're renewing themselves. They're in a connected state. You're honoring yourself. You are worthy. So all of this is so foundational to liberation and taking a healing root in your life. And if you only take away one thing from today, I know, give Robin a microphone and she'll talk for a really long time. Take this away. The busy feeds the urgency. The urgency feeds capitalism. Capitalism supports white supremacy. The status quo wants you to be a cog in the wheel. So what do we do? How do we stop being a cog? Well, Trisha suggests we take a nap. We need to rest. We need to slow down. That's gonna look different for everybody. For some people, it might mean setting your alarm clock an hour early before the house wakes up, making a cup of tea, sitting in your favorite chair, and just being human. Other people, it might look like taking a 20 minute nap during lunch. Some people, it might mean finding a yoga practice. Um, a word of caution though, before you rest, consider people of color. If you choose to rest doing X, Y, and Z, ensure it's at no one's expense. Don't rest to make a black woman work. I think we can dismantle white supremacy one, mat, one nap at a time. I hope you'll join me after platform. I'm gonna lead a nap practice over in the social hall. There's pillows in the office. Um, I think there's some blankets, chair. I hope you'll join me. I hope you'll leave your phones in the office and you'll come in the social hall just doing the human being. Now, let me just go back one more time to these initial emails. Number one, 
was all about wanting a specific message in a specific way in a specific time frame. Y'all, I have news for you. I'm not a robot. My colleagues are not robots. I am paid by you all, I think, to use my education, my training, to decide best practices for Wes's communication. Your agenda is not the Wes agenda. I hope your agenda can align. I hope you can come into the fold, but please know we're a community of many, not a community of one. Email number two, talking about the information being dropped off in news and notes. Again, the urgency, like, can you all, do you feel the urgency? This language making a giant problem out of something that like, yeah, y'all, it's inconvenient, but click the button. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Click, you don't need to email me, just click the button. Email number three, overlapping meetings. This faux urgency again, right? I believe we are a community that's woven. That means if you have to pick one meeting or another, you're not so important that the community will falter. Your friends are gonna miss you, so go out to coffee and catch up on what you missed on. Talk to people. Say, hey, I'm gonna do, do X, you're gonna do Y. Let's catch up. I'll fill you in on what I did, you fill me in on what you did. We are a community that cannot falter because one person can't do everything. And finally, email number four. I have a very visceral <laughs> reaction to this email. I'm very like wiggly because it's like, it's in my body and I got to feel it out. Um, to call for something to be changed because one person just deems it to be a conflict for themselves really doesn't give credit to the amount of work my colleagues are doing to build relationships. The people I work with work so damn hard, y'all. So damn hard. I promise you, Maceo is working with our renters to build long-term relationships. He's not working with renters because he wants a check. I mean, the check's great, right? Like, we love that the lights are on. But the goal is that these renters enjoy renting from us, that their experience is thoughtful and intentional and genuine, so they come back. Please give him the benefit of the doubt. I promise you, he's really good at his job. We are really lucky. Indara being a woman of color who is trying to revive our Sunday school program, y'all, we have to step up and make Sunday school happen. My family is here because of Sunday school. I don't know how many of y'all knew me when I joined. We lived in Woodbridge. People told us, why are you driving here? Because I want my kid to be somewhere. Please don't let Sunday school end and Indara's work go unappreciated. She has so many wonderful ideas. She just needs hands to make it happen. You know, and Casey, I cannot say enough about my experience working with Casey. Um, honestly, I didn't know somebody could be that intentional. It is amazing to have a boss that sees you um, and I promise you if Casey isn't emailing you back right away it's not that they don't care and it's not that they don't think you're important but maybe somebody's having a hard day and maybe they're being a minister my conclusion I I went back and forth on whether or not to share this, but I think, you know, I've aired it all out, so why not, right? <laughs> Been here eight and a half years. July 1 was year eight of being on staff. 
There's been one phone call that I would deem urgent. In those entire eight years, one phone call. We had a member lose his battle with depression. That's urgent. Newsletters, overlapping meetings, tech glitches are not urgent. I hope you all go take a nap. A lot to think about there. Um, in a moment, we will have our response period, which will give others a chance to come forward and share their reactions to the platform and what it brings up for them. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to have some music and a chance for you to process your thoughts and your feelings and distill the thing that you would say. Feel the fear inside your chest. Watch it ebb and flow. The darkest hour dies out the dawn first clearings yours to reap and sow Thank you. 
This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with us in our own personal experience. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments later if you're watching the recording at that time. If you're here in person, I encourage you to practice the same kind of brevity that our online participants use in their chat. And if you've spoken in recent weeks, please consider leaving space for other voices today. Um, but in a moment, we're going to start with um, Zoom chats, but you'll be able to come to the microphone here on the floor and share your brief comments. But first, let me see where we are at in the chat. Okie dokie. So, uh, Judy Meyer says, thank you, Robin. Bren says, I love you, Robin, and I'm so honored to be your friend. Joe Klein says, I want to put in an additional plug for Rest is Resistance. It's an amazing and powerful read or listen. I'm planning to listen to it a second time. Paul Baker says, excellent talk, Robin. I will look forward to more communication. Mark Mayer says, thanks, Robin. You are also a very good teacher. I learned a lot from you. Barb Nathanson says, very deep and moving talk. A lot to think about. Thank you, Robin. And Shayla Bokum says, wow, Robin. Thank you. It's spelled W-A-A-O-W. Thank you so much for sharing all that from your heart. That was really important for us to hear. I'm sorry if I've taken you or any of the other staff members for granted. Sarah Moore says, thank you, Robin, for your bravery. Uh, Art Steven says, with the movie Barbie, Greta Gerwig addresses many of the power relationships Robin brought up. Going this afternoon. Judy <laughs> um, Meyer says, I have already put on hold, I put a hold on the audiobook version of Rest is Resistance. It looks like a 12 week wait. So, again, back to earlier patience. <laughs> and in the meantime, practice patience. <laughs> Cynthia Goodsman says, thank you, Robin, for making the connections between white supremacy, capitalism, urgency, and revealing that rest is the antidote. I am a regular napper after ruining my health with overwork and overactivity for many years. I feel much more whole when I take the time to rest. So we're going to shift to in the hall commenters. Again, I encourage you to distill to a brief comment. Um, if you want to step forward, say your name and pronouns and make space for others to share. Thank you. John? One second. OK, now it should be that. John? John? Yep, there you go. You just have to John, say a uh, I wanted to express appreciation for something you put right near the very end, Robin. The caveat, rest unless you're doing so burdens a person of color. And I certainly am someone who needs to take a step back, take a breath. But rest as privilege. Um, and so to, to be mindful of who pays um, when I step back. Uh, good morning, uh, Jeff Mehal here. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, what is it about the Kravitzes? What is it about Robin Kravitz? What is it about Mike Kravitz that they can tear me away from a Sunday crossword puzzle? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, the only thing I would say, a very slight recommendation, Robin, is do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I thought your presentation was wonderful this morning. I'd also want to put in a word about white supremacy, and um, it's certainly not a good thing. We tend to associate the words white supremacy with somebody wearing a brown shirt and jackboots and having a swastika armband. 
but I've been reading a book, uh, and I wish I could remember the title of it, which goes into how this myth uh, permeates American society from the inception of the colonies up to now. And I'm finding it a very difficult read because ba one is basically inculcated with these, these values and these depictions from the time one enters public school or private school if you really got the money. And it was a shock to me to learn that people in the 18th century that you had thought of as free thinkers, as progressives, people like Walt Whitman and um, Thoreau, uh, as much as they were against slavery, um, they really, that only tells part of the story, that they really wanted slaves to be freed from their bondage so they could be forcibly deported back to Africa. And that's something I didn't learn in the schools. No doubt about it, slavery, slavery is a horrible thing. Uh, the comments of the current Florida governor notwithstanding. Um, but it's very difficult for me as now a senior citizen to try to unlearn this. Um, and I've become so, I'm set in my ways and I'm just, I like learning but it's difficult to unlearn. Hi, I'm Laura DeShulo, she, her. Um, I'm currently in a medical treatment that requires me to have a doctor's appointment every single weekday for seven weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and at, when this was starting, I talked to my boss and I was like, here's how I'll work it out so I don't have to miss any work. I'll come in earlier in the morning and I'll make up some time at home and I'll still be able to work 40 hours a week. And now as I'm coming to the end, I'm finding I'm exhausted and I'm ending up oversleeping, sleeping through my alarm and using some vacation time every week instead of working the 40 hours that I had planned. And in both cases with either the revised schedule or with using some vacation time, my boss has been incredibly understanding and I don't think I'd be able to get the health care I need if I didn't have such an understanding boss. And I wish that for everyone. Also, this is something that even though insurance covers, there's still a big out-of-pocket cost for me. So um, there, there are multiple layers of access to the things that people need for their health and fitting it into your schedule and getting the rest that you need. Robin, thank you for sharing everything. I hope I haven't been taking you for granted. And I hope that Calliope will be joining us for snuggles at the NAP ministry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Sonia. My pronouns are she and her. Um, Robin, thank you so much for today's platform. Um, I always do my best to be kind and respectful of the staff. Um, it is possible that sometimes I fail. So if anybody sees me being disrespectful or discourteous or whatever to the staff, please let me know. One of the things that occurred to me when I was listening to the very beginning of what Robin had to say was that I knew exactly what she was talking about in each and every case, right? It was, com I, I had, had witnessed all of those particular communications, um, either directly or, you know, indirectly. And I realized that something I did not do, even though I cringed about them when I saw them, was that I did not privately reach out to the person who made them and say, hey, maybe that wasn't cool. And I wonder whether if we all did that, right, when we saw another West member doing something that was not so cool with respect to a member of the staff, perhaps we could call that person in and, you know, reach out. Anyway, thanks. I'm Michelle, she, her. I don't come here very often anymore. Um, and I'm not sure what drew me to come today, except for I really enjoy listening to Robin and the idea of rest made me um, think that it would be a good place to be. But I really want to thank you, Robin, because my core value that I really um, wanted to talk about was honesty. And 
applaud you for having a bravery to be honest about what happens in this community sometimes. Um, and like Sonia mentioned, I do think it's our job to elicit the best. That's what one of our tenants, that our job is to help people become better people, not help people be inconsiderate and abusive to each other. So um, I really appreciate what you said today, Robin, and I'm gonna probably listen to it again. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Maceo, he, him. I am Robin's work husband, thanks Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna follow up with what Jeff said. I was, I was out of town when, when Mike gave his platform and listened and shared an air bud with a friend of mine and um, what, I, what I responded to him afterwards was like, when you guys, when, Mike, when you start your, your own congregation, I, I wanna be one of your members. <laughs> And now it looks like it's gonna be like co-pastor. <laughs> so I'm, you know, if y'all end up in Utah or wherever, I'm, I'm, I'm a fly in or something. <laughs> um, but absolutely in, in the last year or so, I've become very weepy. And in, in both of those platforms, I, it just emoted these tears. And uh, for me, you know, I, I saw my mom, my mom just turned 80 and I just, you know, think about, um, a lot of what she had to, to go through. It reminded me of a comment that she, she made about one of my dad's sisters. Um, and she said, you know what, um, I just love, you know, my, my sister-in-law Muriel because she took such good care of my kids um, in a way that that was always a concern. I thought about like many of the black mothers that I, that I know, I, I have a, a friend who I just recently saw, I have, her, kid, her oldest is like eight and, you know, she's going through the separation and she says, you know, every time somebody asks me how I am, I respond about the kids, like the separation of who her identity is as this individual human being is versus her, her mother, uh, her motherhood. And so I'm definitely going to share this. Um, the bravery that you took on this um, was amazing. Um, you know, you were talking about kind of changing narratives, and, and I know I, I kind of look young, y'all, but I'm in the second half of my life, okay? And I've been telling people this, and in part of that, there are these narratives that I've lived with, and it includes white supremacy, and it includes patriarchy, um, and I am only just looking to like find people who are really regularly trying to establish these narratives that we did not inherit that we did inherit that we did not choose and try to make things better and so wherever you go you are are more than co-workers and in-law co-workers is that how they call it <laughs> you know I, I appreciate you yeah i i love y'all and and i appreciate um you as friends so thank you I'm glad to witness that right there, right? Because I was thinking about hugging Robin, right? And I said, no, because a dog might bite me, right? So I'm not going to do that, right? But I, I did want to say, right, I think I'm going to be saying something in a minute, but I, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to say that I really appreciate your platform. Your presentation was perfect. Um, part of the work I do is with a lot of mothers. And, and so all of what you were saying about, you know, the urgency of now for black mothers, you know, saying how they struggle every day really resonated and I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, I'm Stuart Anderson. <laughs> Thanks for all the comments in person. Let me see if there's anything more. Oh, yep, hang on a second. There's definitely some more in the chat. Okay. Um, sorry, Marlon, thank you for making. So Eric Moyer begins with, please bear with the incoherence in the following. Robin said that if you not make sure it's not at someone's expense, that a black woman does not need to work so you can rest. He says, I don't see how that's possible. Rest or even just not being run ragged is always at someone's expense. For example, I have to say no to teaching Seek right now and to doing OBS and to a long list of things. And I appreciate that West is a place I can say no. 
However, because I say no, someone else must do the work or it won't be done. And because Seek is critical for Wes's future, that may damage Wes for the long term. In this case, a black woman in Dara is doing some of what I won't do. However, I cannot let that stop me or I won't ever rest. It's an inversion of the golden rule. I need to treat myself as I wish to treat others. This is a continual struggle for me in many areas, so I can't say the above is more than my current tentative resolution of the tension between my needs and those of others. Thank you all for your attention and your thoughts that you've shared. And I think there's lots more conversation to come. But just as we share our perspectives in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. And this month, we are pleased to support Family and Friends of Incarcerated People, or FFOIP, in both the school supply drive and as August Chair the Plate recipient. And we have the advantage today that Stuart is indeed here with us. So Stuart, if you want to come to the microphone and tell us briefly a bit about FFOIP and how we can be supportive. So, hi, everybody. Uh, so first, two things. Let me first apologize to Wes, right, for not being here more often. But again, I'm in the midst of this battle of urgency and I'm being pulled in all directions. Um, our all volunteer organization, and it's not easy trying to um, help families who are struggling. Uh, and then the second thing is, I, I'm. No, I think I probably was going to sit down, right? Because I want this to be impersonal, right? I don't want to be standing up in front of people. You know? So I was going to sit down, but then I realized that this online thing is not going to capture my voice, so I need to stay and stand, right? So Thank imagine, you. if you will, that I'm sitting down, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Family and Friends of Incarcerated People, real quick, is an organization that's got one goal, and that's to fight intergenerational incarceration and, you know, school to prison pipeline. That's it. That's what we're doing. How do we do that? We do that by working with the families of those who are and have been incarcerated. You know? And then we also by you know, proxy have to work with some individuals as they come home, moms and dads and auntie, uncles and brothers. And so I wanna, I wanna uh, for those in the room, you can kind of turn your head and look. I brought a family with me today, right? May and her daughters, right? And, 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 and so there are two more little ones downstairs. Uh, and, and so I've been telling them about Wes, as I do with all of the people that I work with and everything. And uh, I got a call saying, Stuart, we want you to say something to the county. We got some new people, so they need to know who you are, right? And so that's the work that we do. One of the things that has been mentioned is that each year, we do the back to school drive. We encourage West members to come out, not just to give, but to come out. You know, I'm big on you need to see where your donation is going, you know. And you also get a chance to push back on white supremacy when you are in the space with all these children of color, you know. Um, I want to say thank you also for the ongoing support of West and access to this space. You know, some of you may not know that we use this space maybe once or twice a year. Uh, and so I want to say thank you for that. Um, I got a specific qu request. I know that you're going to share the plate with me, but I want you to know what I'm doing with it this time. It's not just going to go to help FFYP and the ongoing stuff of fighting mass incarceration and stuff. We're going to split whatever you give us and we're going to donate it to this family because this family is a family that is terrified of where they are right now, where they live right now. May has lost two sons to gun violence, and the girls are terrified, had the opportunity to meet them and take them out of the city for a day trip, took them to a farm out in Shenandoah. You know, they'd never been out to a farm like that, you know what I'm saying? And so these are things that we do. And so in meeting them, I learned that these two young ladies, right, 
are fearful of losing another sibling to gun violence, and they desperately want to move from where they are. And so I'm trying to raise $4,000 for their first month rent and their security deposit. And so I'm not saying that you got to get that to me. I'm just saying this is just what, what I'm doing, right? So I, I want you to know this is the type of work that FFYP is constantly involved in beyond just giving away some school supplies and, and, and taking young people on trips and things of that nature. You know, I just want you to know we're in some life-saving situations to pull some mothers out of that situation of trying to figure out every day and being stuck in that sense of urgency and locked in as a cog. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank all of you for listening to me. And we always appreciate the opportunity to come here in West and, you know, just participate. So I pledge to be here once a month. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stuart, for helping us really get more, even more insight into this cr crucial, I would say this is urgent, right? This is urgent work um, and, and making it re very real for us. And so, um, and, and offering us opportunities of ways to um, try and address the situations um, that are really unacceptable. Um, so we do indeed hope that everyone will join in helping, uh, you know, tech with the family support that work. There's also, we'll um, drop into the chat um, and send out via email um, a link for an Amazon wish list for school supplies so they can go right to FFOIP, it cuts out all the schlepping, et cetera. Um, and we want to have that um, together by the 20th of August so that they're available because the picnic that Stuart referenced on August 26th is when the students will receive those resources and West members are very much invited to be at that picnic um, as well. So more information will be shared about that later. For right now, let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity as we are able. You can donate online through the Simple Give system by either texting an amount to 202-335-1885 or go to tiny.cc slash westgives or click give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. If you prefer to donate in person, just you can put cash or check in a basket on the way out at the, at the back of the hall um, and you can always send a check to the office um, by mail. Thank you for your generosity, and we will now receive your gifts and the gift of music. Drop inside the ocean But there's some karma on the ride There's a place where I am going It's out of my control So I'm gonna coast for a little while Oh, brother, there's a line I know I saw it in our father He couldn't ease her worry now even though we really loved her It's out of my control So I'm gonna coast for a little while It's out of my control So I'm gonna coast for a little while So I'm gonna coast for a little while It's out of my control So I'm gonna coast for a little while
Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together. Staff members, Casey Slack, and Dara Miles, Robin Kravitz, Taman, Tamana Baranji, and Maceo Thomas. And our platform production team, which includes the tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, and in-person greeters, whose name you'll see on the closing credits slide. At the conclusion of platform, please join us for social hour, either here or via Zoom. And those who are here in person can join Robin in the social hall for some nap ministry practice. First though, just a few things upcoming in the life of our community. There are a number of ways to stretch your mind this week. The philosophy group is meeting today at one, the mindfulness group meets Monday at 7.30, and the mental health support group meets Tuesday at 6 p.m. All of these meetings are via Zoom, and the links can be found in the news and notes email from Thursday. You might need to click at the bottom to get all those details. This coming Saturday, April, uh, sorry, August 12th from noon to three is the Tri-Society Picnic, which is gonna be taking heat place here at West and we'll be joining with members um, from Baltimore and Northern Virginia Ethical Societies as well. There's gonna be a light lunch provided courtesy of a small grant from the AU and there's an RSVP and sign up form for bringing drinks as desserts. I think everybody was supposed to do that by yesterday. So, so today you need to go and do your RSVP because <laughs> there are people who need to plan <laughs> accordingly. So your desire to be slow in the process does not need to negatively affect others. So I would suggest you check that out. It would be great fun. Um, and Donna Taylor, the part of the reason you see I was just conveying with Donna is she's spearheading the event for us and would love to hear from you. So uh, also if you can help with setup and or cleanup is with that event. Um, at the same time as that, there will be a virtual memorial service for ethical culture leader Susan Rose Teshu. And it's happening in person in Boston at two o'clock, but Judy Myers is gonna facilitate the opportunity to ascend, to attend that via Zoom meeting from here at West. So you can come to the picnic, step out. All things are possible, right? We work it out. Are you a cook, a baker, a gift basket maker? Do you like parties, themes, and helping Wes reach its financial dreams? Auction needs help from now to November. Let's make it an event Wes will remember. You can contact Emily Newman for planning, donating, and day of volunteering. Next Sunday, our platform will be co-presented by our Sunday officiants group. We'll be bidding farewell to our college-bound students, and we'll also have time to explore ways that we can each become more involved to help Wes be the vibrant, flourishing community we want it to be. Speaking of which, we are looking for people to join uh, some crucial committees to replace some of the labor that our budget does not allow us to pay staff to do. So if you have any interest in learning about and supporting the stewardship and finance teams, the communication team, team to reimagining Wes's programs for children and youth, the greeters and welcome team, the tech team and the music selection team, you can find that list of teams and sign up links on the website at ethicalsociety.org slash connection and learn more about that also next Sunday. That's it for our announcements today. You can always find details by checking out Wes's website, ethicalsociety.org, or reading those email messages that come through in news and notes each week. Thank you all for being here at Platform today, whether in person, via Zoom, or watching later. And now you're invited to sing along with the very charming closing kindness song. Flowers grow from the places that we sow, sharing colors, sharing beauty, making joy. You can count on me, I can count on you, cause you care about me and I care about you. The 
A last few quick reminders before we leave. If you are new to our community, please introduce yourself in person and or via the connection form at tiny.cc slash westconnects or an email to membership at ethicalsociety.org, which just connects you to information, does not obligate you to membership, just to be clear. For those who wish to socialize online to reach the virtual coffee hour, point your browser to tiny.cc slash westcoffeehour. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment to a world where love and justice cross all borders. Again, thank you for joining today's platform and we look forward to connecting with you all again soon.